Ajahn Fung was teaching people to meditate, and they'd gotten to the point where the breath stopped. A sense of the breath energy filling the body. All the pores of the skin opened up and all the breath channels in the body connected. After he'd had you stay there for a while, so he got used to being in that state, he'd have you focus on that sensation of space. And you begin to realize that the space you're focusing on had no limitations. When you focused on the body, things go out to the skin, or maybe just a little bit beyond the skin sometimes, in the case of the sort of energy cocoon around the body. But with space, there are no limits. And after you, used to, you were used to staying with that perception of space, then it'd have you focus on the awareness of the space, which likewise had no limits. So he'd have you wait until your concentration was strong so you could stay with these perceptions. The mind would have the precision, stability, that it could stay with these perceptions for a long period of time. But they are useful perceptions to keep in mind even before you reach that state in the concentration. When the body feels weak, you can remind yourself there is an awareness that's larger than the body and whose energy doesn't have to depend on the body. And when things in your life seem to be crowding in, you can remember there's an awareness that's larger than all of those things. And using the perception, you can get in touch with it for at least some period of time. And it's helpful in a lot of ways. One, to stir up whatever energy you need to just hang on, stick with things regardless of how bad they are, either in the body or in the world around you. Or to simply just be aware of whatever comes up, because sometimes things will come up in the meditation and you're not sure whether they're good or bad. So you want to be able to step back and say, well, let's just observe them for a while. And the sense of the larger observer is a really good place to go, because it helps remind you that when you're going to watch something, you want to watch it 360 degrees. You want to look all around you especially when something's coming up in the mind, and you want to see its effects. You want your awareness to be as broad as possible. So it's good to practice that perception. This is one of the reasons why John Fung would have his students chant the, the Divine Mantra, because it gets you used to thinking in terms of the elements of the body or the properties of the body. And then this property of space and the property of consciousness. You get more and more familiar with the concept, and it's easier to stay with your perception of whatever sen sensations might correspond to space, or whatever sense of awareness or aspect of your awareness seems to be large. So you can take that as your safe spot. It's a good foundation. The Buddha talks about this in terms of several dimensions. He talks about making the mind broad, expansive. talks about making it tall and high, and he makes, talks about making it deep. For broad and expansive, it basically talks about two things. One is developing the Brahma-viharas, limitless goodwill, limitless compassion. Limitless empathetic joy, limitless equanimity. He compares it to a large river. On the one end, when people say really nasty things to you, you want to develop a sense of goodwill that's as expansive as the river Ganges, that no amount of nastiness can destroy. You want to cherish this as you would, as I said, a mother would her only child, this ability to keep this determination in mind. 
that you're always going to act on goodwill regardless. When the mind is like the river Ganges, it's just like a situation where a man comes along and says he's going to get all the water out of the river Ganges, and he takes a torch, hopes to burn it all up or evaporate all the water, and he said the man would just wear himself out before all the water was done. So they want to develop that kind of goodwill. You want your goodwill not to be dependent on other people's being nice. And it's not a case of you're, you're giving them something they don't deserve. You have to remember that you benefit from your goodwill. You want to make sure that goodwill informs all of your intentions, all of your motivations, so that you don't end up creating a lot of unskillful karma. So when we talk about measureless goodwill, it doesn't mean simply there's no outside limit to it, but it also means that there are no conditions that you place on it. Whenever it's appropriate, that's what you act on. Now, there are times also when you have to develop equanimity, regardless of how much you might want somebody to be happy. It's not going to happen right away, so you have to develop equanimity around that. But again, that too has to be measureless a quality you develop so that you can call on it whenever you need it. You also want to make your goodwill as expansive as the earth. Just as a man comes along and says he's going to try to get all the earth out of earth, and he spits here and there, and he urinates here and there, and he digs here and there. He's never going to come to the end of the great earth, so you want your goodwill to be as expansive as the great earth. And then, of course, there's that image of the, the lump of salt. This has to do with your past karma, any past bad karma you have. If you can make your mind expansive through the development of limitless goodwill and the rest of the Brahma Paras, Then if the results of any past bad karma come, he says they hardly even touch the mind. In the same way that a lump of salt thrown into the river would not make the water in the river too salty to drink, as opposed to water in a cup. All the water you have is just the water in the cup. You put this big lump of salt in, you can't drink it at all. But it's not just the development of the Brahma Viharas that's important here. It's also the ability to develop your mind so that it doesn't get overwhelmed by pain, doesn't get overwhelmed by pleasure. In other words, you want your mind to be larger than pain, larger than pleasure. And one way of preventing it from being overwhelmed by pleasure is to practice with pleasure. Sometimes you hear the the idea that you don't want to avoid strong states of concentration because the pleasure is just so seductive it's going to pull you off the path. But if you don't work with pleasure, how are you going to overcome it? If you just avoid it, then when it really hits, you're not going to have any tools to consciously try to in induce pleasurable sensations wherever you can in the body through the breath. In the beginning, it'll just be certain areas of the body, certain channels of the body that you can get comfortable, but focus on those. And as those become more and more pleasurable and more and more connected, then further connections develop, and then more connections and more connections until you've got the whole body connected with a sense of ease. Then you'll Recognize for yourself the tone that feels easeful throughout the body, and you can go right there. And even though as you create the ease, it can get really intense. In the beginning it's not so intense, but it gets more, gets more and more intense. You don't want to focus on the ease as your topic. You want to stay with the breath, because the breath is the source of how that ease is produced. And so you learn to let the ease do its work in the body, but you're not going to get overwhelmed by it. You're not going to lose your focus. You're not going to lose your grasp on the breath. And that's your practice in learning how not to be overcome by pleasure. 
similar principle works with pain. You work with the breath. And there may be painful sensations in the body that even good breathing can't overcome. But you learn how to not let yourself get fastened on the pain or overwhelmed by the pain. You've got the parts of the body that you can focus on that are pleasurable. And even if the whole body seems to be painful, you can go to that sense of space that's around the body, permeates through all the different atoms. Then you keep your focus there. And if you can consciously erase from the mind whatever perceptions tell you that there's a limitation to the body, right? that the skin is located here, or the boundary between the body and the air outside is located there, just don't pay attention to those particular sensations and don't interpret those perceptions that way. You find that you've got a, this large awareness that you can back into. And the pains will appear within the awareness, but they don't have to overcome it. Those are some of the ways you make the mind expansive. As for making it tall or high, the Buddha compares discernment to going up on a tower and looking down on the world below, seeing all the concerns of human beings. And when you're looking at them from way up high, they all seem so small. If you could learn how to look at your everyday concerns in the same way, you've heightened the mind. This is one of the terms they use, atechite, and it's one of the meanings, that you raise the level of the mind. You've got a higher level of pleasure, the pleasure of form. And then you can look at the pleasure of sensuality and see that it's got lots and lots of drawbacks. And you look at the everyday concerns that you might feel about this person or that person or this project or whatever. And you see them in the larger scheme of things, that vision the Buddha had of the whole cosmos was a way of heightening the mind and understanding the principle of action. And when you can see the principle of action as universal. And that whatever happens in your life is part of this universal play of forces. It helps to depersonalize it. And this depersonalization is an important aspect to developing discernment. Again, dealing with people saying nasty things. One of the things he has you tell yourself if you're hearing someone really lashing out at you. An unpleasant contact has happened at the ear. We don't usually think in those terms. We usually think, why is that person being so nasty to me? And in doing that, we put ourselves right in the line of fire. Whereas if you can step back, an unpleasant contact is happening at the ear. You've raised the level of your mind. You could look at it and realize. What that person is saying is his or her own karma. It doesn't have to touch you. And the fact that they're saying those things doesn't violate your rights. Because after all, they've got a mouth. They can say whatever they want to with a mouth. But you learn how to take yourself out of the line of fire. And you can actually feel sorry for the person if they're simply speaking out of greed, aversion, or delusion. If what they have to say is actually true, that you know, you've done something wrong, okay, you're in a better position to admit it, to learn from it. So this ability to depersonalize things, that's what heightens the mind, raises the level of mind. So you're up on the tower looking down at people, or up on a mountain looking down at the people in the valley. As for deepening the mind, The Buddha usually uses that to refer to arahanship, the point where the mind is so deeply rooted, like that stone column, sixteen spans tall, eight spans are buried in the rock of a mountain. As for the eight spans that are above, 
above ground. No matter how strong the winds come from any direction, these are the winds of gain, loss, status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure, and pain. The stone column doesn't shiver or shake. Sometimes the Buddha will use the image of depth for not the depth of the ocean. Uh, the fully awakened mind is unfathomable, like the sea, and it's just so deep you can't measure it, so big you can't measure it. But even though that technically applies to our hardship, you can hold that perception in mind that you do have a property of awareness here, which is larger than everything it knows. It can encompass everything. Hold that image in mind. And it keeps on knowing, regardless of whether the body feels strong, the body feels weak, the body feels sick, whatever. And Jai Mahabu even says that at the moment you're about to die, and say there's a pain in the body, to try to get in touch with that sense of awareness and ask yourself which is going to disappear first, the pain or the awareness. And it's going to be the pain is going to go first. As long as you can keep that perception in mind, it gives you the strength to deal with a lot of things that otherwise you couldn't deal with. You're less likely to be overwhelmed. And as you hold this image in mind, it's a larger awareness. It's a lot easier to deal with distractions. Instead of thinking of your mind being here and then zipping over there, getting distracted, you realize the distraction is appearing within this field of your awareness. So it's just a matter of allowing it to dissolve, and the awareness is still there. So this is one of the reasons we work on expanding our conscious sense of the body. So you're sensitive to the whole body as you breathe in, sensitive to the whole body as you breathe out. And you're trying to develop a sense of goodwill. That's immeasurable. So that regardless of what people do, and even though there are times when you have to say no to people, you have to say things that are displeasing to them. But that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that your goodwill has shrunk. Because after all, letting people get away with all kinds of nastiness is not being kind to them. But you've got this larger awareness, which is not going to be destroyed by anything. That's the perception you want to hold in mind. And even though you haven't yet touched that awareness or don't have a really secure hold on it, the, the simple fact that you can have that concept and revert to that concept when you need it, that helps get you through a lot of difficulties. To so practice thinking about your awareness in these terms, broad, tall, deep. what the Buddha calls expanded awareness, or the expanded mind, mahagatang jittang, the heightened mind, atijjata. Because it's one of the key concepts in the practice, the key concepts and the skills you need to get the mind past suffering.